Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Amma ba'd. Ahabati fillah. Continue on in our study of Balugh al-Maram. The comprehensive book. Kitab al-Jami'. In the chapter <clears throat> of uh, asceticism and piety, Bab uh, Zuhud wa al wara And we were discussing those group of ahadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, <coughs> which refer to the concepts and illustrate the concepts of zuhud or asceticism and piety meaning to leave off those things which have no concern for you and do not benefit you especially in the hereafter and likewise that do not uh, that only bring you harm and we reached Hadith 1270 narrated Ibn Abbasan radiallahu ta'ala anhuma one day I was riding behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said young man be mindful of Allah and he will protect you. Be mindful of Allah and you will find him before you. When you ask anything, ask it from Allah. And if you seek help, seek help from Allah. Reported by a Tirmidhi who verified it as Hassan, as good and Sahih, authentic. Hassan al-Sahih. And this is one of the classifications of uh, authentic, authentic uh, hadith, of a sound hadith. In this hadith azim, <coughs> the hadith of uh, Ibn Abbas and radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, we find the importance of of seeking refuge in Allah, tawakkul al Allah, putting our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by remembering Him often and seeking His support and assistance. So, this is a hadith alim, a very comprehensive hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which affirms Tawheed al-Ibadah and Tawheed al rububiyyah This hadith affirms the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and likewise the that all worship belongs to him and him alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we direct our worship. We seek his assistance, his support in all that we do. And this will earn the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is in this chapter of Zuhr wa wara because it is a part of zuhud and wara, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, putting your trust in Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, <laughs> leaving off indulgence in the dunya for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not letting materialism distract you from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So we can see the relationship here between, with this hadith, being in the chapter of Zuhud, asceticism, and uh, wara, piety. Because everything that has to do with worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is beneficial. And that means it's an indulgence in that which is benefit, that will benefit you in this life as well as the hereafter. Wara and Zuhud entails leaving off those things which bring no benefit. And of course, that means those things which have no remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in fact busy you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and furthermore call you to the muharramat, those things which displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I believe that's clear if we look at that relationship here, this, the, the relationship of this hadith to this uh, chapter that we are uh, currently uh, studying. And... <clears throat> in this hadith we see that we should focus our energies on asking for the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deal with the trials and tribulations we deal with our, in life and we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek his assistance before we make decisions and that the more that we're obedient to Allah and that we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will preserve us. And if you seek support and help, then seek it from Allah as the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam said. From the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. First, we see the permissibility of riding uh, behind someone on a riding animal, for example, a horse or a donkey or a camel or what have you, that of course this is something permissible. And I, and I even would further go and say, depending on the society, that would also make the difference in the riding animal. For example, if you are in perhaps a village in certain parts of India, for example, I don't think it's the normal custom to ride an elephant, but there are people who do ride an elephant for whatever benefit that is. So again, that would fit under this, uh, the permissibility that there is no harm in doing such an action. And there are many ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showing the humbleness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he was... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, that he was uh, behind, riding behind uh, someone on uh, riding animals. Uh, and another point with regards to that, again, it goes to another hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la darar wa la dirar. There is no harm and there's no reciprocating harm. So as long as there's no harm to the riding animal, meaning, for example, someone who decides to ride and overload a donkey or overload some animal, which is causing them harm, causing them illness, causing them ailment, then this is not permissible because there is no harming nor reciprocating harm as the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, mentioned. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, illustrates for us the humbleness uh, of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in riding uh, donkeys and riding hum animals that illustrated uh, his humbleness that he did not have to have the you know he didn't have to ride a a beautiful uh, horse 
or some other riding animal or that he was too proud or he needed to be carried or something like this. But the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, who has more status, more position than any king or any president or any leader who has ever walked the face of the earth, he sallallahu alayhi wasallam rode on riding beasts such as donkeys and so forth. And was... Uh, sometimes had people riding behind him, and at times he rode uh, behind others. So this shows the humility of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. Uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is that it is sometimes necessary when speaking to someone about something very important to raise one's voice and really emphasize that to them, even if they are close to you in the same room, even if they are close to you. And this was a situation that the Prophet, والسلام, he was on this riding animal with Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, And obviously they were very close to one another and the Prophet والسلام, raised his voice and really emphasized and said, Ya Gulam, O Gulam, you know, and to make sure that he was heard. And so this shows the permissibility of doing, uh, doing so. Uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is we see the excellent wasaya or advice of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam uh, that when he said to Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma when he said ifadallaha yahfadak ifadallaha tujidhu tujahaka that when he sallallahu alayhi wasallam uh, gave Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma this very immensely important advice, which was in a very simple phrase, a very short phrase, which had immense benefit, immense meaning, and should have immense impact upon us in our practice. And it is an issue of aqidah, of ittiqad, and our practice of tawheed. In that he said, Ifadallaha, preserve or protect Allah, meaning protect the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Protect the commandments of Allah Azza wa Jal, his the borders and the boundaries that he has set, the limits. And then he mentioned the jaza, Yahfadak that he will protect you. If you protect the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're obedient to Allah. So we have to be honest with ourselves. Are we obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he will protect you. That's the natija. If you protect, you know, pre preserve those boundaries of Allah, so he emphasized it. There it was twice. If of the law, he said it twice. If of the law, yahfadak. If of the law, tujidhu tijahaka. Protect uh, uh, the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will find him in front of you. You'll find him directing you. You'll find him guiding you. So this is an excellent reminder for us to preserve the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It really comes, kitabi la wa sunnatu rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, وَعَتِيُ اللَّهُ وَعَتِيُ الرُّسُولُ Obey Allah and obey His Messenger. And obey His Messenger. If you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you obey His Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. You'll find guidance. You'll find direction. You'll find support. You'll find assistance. Because a lot of times we say that. We make lip service. We do pray. We do fast. We do some ibadah. But we don't really give it its haqq. And we still do acts of disobedience here and there, in front of us and behind us. 
out loud, openly and hidden, and we still want the 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 the, the assistance and preservation of Eliza Wajel. So if we're honest with us and we perfect our ibadah and hakaka tawheed and the other everything that stems from it, we're striving our best will have the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith of the Message of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam is that the one who preserves the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, by not going beyond them, and his sharia, that Allah will preserve him in his religion, in his body, in his wealth, and regarding his family, and his honor. So that is, that's really a very important faidah that we need to take to heart. And Allah the Almighty says in Kitab al Kareem, Inna Allah yudafi'u an al amanu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al Kareem, Verily Allah defends those who believe. So if you were truly from Ahl Iman and you're striving to perfect your Iman, you'll have the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith, and we made uh, an ishara or we pointed this out prior to this is that this hadith also illustrates for us that part of the reward that a person receives or the action that a person does that's righteous their reward is of the same kind of the same uh, gents if you will and this is illustrated in the statement, and that probably will make it clear, is that when a person protects the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will protect him. So that means that the person has done this good act of preserving the hudud of Allah, the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their reward is that Allah protects them. So they both have to do with protection. You preserve the commands of Allah, Allah will preserve you. Your reward is Allah will preserve you. So that's what it means, al-jaza min jins al -amu. The reward is part and parcel with the action that is done. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that preserving the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that a person should be determined, strong, and going forward with determination and not be concerned with what people see or say with regards to that taking the choice of obedience and righteousness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is illustrated in the statement when the Prophet والسلام, said Allah, preserve the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala those boundaries of Allah and he will preserve you meaning you don't need anyone else no one else is going to preserve you like your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and if your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't preserve you no one can can assist you. And this comes later in the same hadith, in the in the in a longer version of the hadith, where the Prophet said, that if the nations gather together to benefit you with something, they can't benefit you except with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for you. And if they gather together, meaning all the people gather together, all of the creation gather together 
to harm you with something. They can't harm you except with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for you. So that that's, if we have true Iman, in this hadith alone, and we practice it, we'll have immense khair, and immense benefit, and strong Iman, and be able to persevere through many trials and tribulations, because resting is sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist you. That's very important, that's Iman. A last benefit that we'll mention with regards to this hadith and the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also that a person should be determined and a person must seek help and support and assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam said in the hadith, فَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتُ فِاسْتَعَنْ بِاللَّهِ فَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتُ فِاسْتَعَنْ بِاللَّهِ That if you seek assistance, then seek it from Allah. So I hope it's clear how this hadith emphasizes Tawheed, Tawheed uh, al-Uluhiyya, that we're going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, seeking his support, seeking his assistance, asking him, seeking his favors and bounties, putting our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help and rectify our affairs and to be preserved, preserving his his boundaries and Allah preserving, having Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in turn preserving us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be of those, be of the, uh, the Ahlul Tawakkal. In the next hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, <coughs> narrated Sahl ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. A man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, O oh, oh Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, direct me to a deed which if I do it, I shall be loved by Allah and by the people. He replied, Practice Zuhd, subhanAllah, meaning abstinence, in the world and Allah will love you and abstain from people's possessions and they will love you. Ru'ahu ibn Majah and others reported it and it has a Hassan chain of narrators. This hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam illustrates the characteristic of zuhud and its benefit. That by zuhud, the abstinence, this asceticism of leaving off excess or excessiveness and leaving off those things which have no benefit for you and leaving off desiring others property and borrowing and taking and things like this that people and you find this in the walk in the reality is that when people people generally have a respect a higher respect for people who never ask them anything or rarely ask them for anything and I found this myself in practice that the less that you require and ask of the people, generally they respect you more because they don't feel threatened in their property. They're more inclined to loan you, to offer to assist you if you need assistance. If you're not one of those people who are always asking, always borrowing, always people feel threatened around you. If they're eating, they know that you're going to be the first one to come and ask for their food or want to partake in their food. If you are involved, uh, if you have wealth or something, they know that you're going to be the first one to call them and say, hey, can you loan me some money? Can I borrow? Can I, you know, they, they, those people, those kind of people that are the ones who are always asking, always begging, always taking, then they generally have less status with the people. 
this is the general way and according to the fitra the nature of people the, the general nature and inclination people feel threatened <clears throat> and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in this hadith that if you don't threaten the people's property basically what means the implication that they will love you that this will increase the love for you and abstain from people's property people's possessions and they will love you so that's the natija that's the end result that if you abstain from always asking always begging always taking always borrowing then you will gain the people's love so so for the one who's concerned about the love of people and we all are to a greater or lesser extent this is one of the most assured ways don't be a threat to people and don't be taking from people all the time what we learn from this hadith, the hadith of Sahal, Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala'in, one of the first benefits that we gain from this hadith is it shows the hirs of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala'inhum ajma'een. Hirs for knowledge. And their, their vigilance for knowledge and their vigilance for uh, istiqama, for being straight and being upon the religion and being upon the deen. Because in this hadith, Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, O Allah's messenger, direct me to a deed which if I do it, I shall be loved by Allah and by the people. So here, Sa'ad ibn Sahal, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for that which will benefit him in this life as well as hereafter by gaining the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of people. And those things which benefit us, they fall under what? What are we? What is this whole chapter about? This whole chapter is about zuhud and wara. <coughs> that... The, uh, uh, trying to attain those things which benefit you in the hereafter and leaving off those things which bring no benefit for the hereafter. So here, this shows the hirs of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, and especially Sahal ibn Sa'ad, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, specifically in this hadith, their hirs, uh, uh, their vigilance for asking about and seeking knowledge about those things which will benefit them. Another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that the this hadith illustrates also those ahadith which are a jawami a kalam that they are uh, small phrases and small pieces of advice with immense comprehensive meaning immensely comprehensive meaning meaning plethora of benefits many 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 benefits from a very short phrase or sentence and we know the message of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was known for this and here he sallallahu alaihi wasallam says Azhad fi dunya. Practice this asceticism or this uh, this asceticism or this leaving off what people uh, you know, this abstinence from what people covet And you'll gain the love of Allah and the love of the people. And a very that was a very simple short phrase from the Jawami Akalam. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is this hadith uh, 
affirms for us the love of Allah Azza wa Jal. As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam said, Yuhibbuk Allah. That Allah will love you. And Ahl Sunnah, they affirm the love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because they, and that it is real love, but it is unlike the love of His creation. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really loves. He loves his, his servants. He loves the 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 mutatahirin. He loves the sabirin. He loves the the mutawakkilin. He loves all of those people who put their trust in him and that are the those who purify themselves and those uh who do who are obedient to him and those who practice zuhud as he as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam illustrated. So Ahl Sunnah affirms that without distorting its meaning and without saying that his love is like the love of the creation. We don't make those those resemblance, the tashbih. But rather, Ahl Sunnah, we affirm what Allah, what Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam affirm. Another benefit of this hadith is that the person who does not possess this asceticism, this, this zuhud, this abstinence in the dunya and is materialistic. Their heart is yata'alla qalubihim ila dunya. That their hearts are inclined and consumed by the dunya as we mentioned in the hadith uh, about uh, uh, the, the one who covets the dinar and the dirham. You know, that they worship Material, worship, material wealth. We talked about that hadith in depth. And this hadith also is a ishara to that. This hadith directly, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used the term zuhud. So, the one who does not possess this zuhd in the dunya, and their hearts are inclined towards the dunya, you know, meaning the material wealth and the acquisition of wealth and loving that, that these are some of the reasons that negates the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that these are, this is one of the reasons that a person would distance himself between them and their Lord. Tabaraka wa ta'ala wa iyadhan billah wa iyakum min dhalika. We, we seek refuge in that. For ourselves and for you from being in that state in which we don't gain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the pleasure of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. May Allah bless us with His love and, and, and His pleasure. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith and the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this hadith uh, encourages us to, uh, to practice asceticism and not be uh, so material and not be uh, especially having those things in our heart. Having a love for material wealth in our heart and allowing it to consume us. And this hadith encourages us to not want and desire and covet what other people possess, meaning to take from them. That doesn't mean as it doesn't contradict the other hadith where the Prophet والسلام, said that, you know, one of the types of of envy, if you will, uh, is that wanting, you know, and this is one of the lawful or permissible types of coveting from others, is that you covet from someone who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is favored with knowledge or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is favored with wealth in not to take away from, not from hasid, not from uh, wanting to remove their wealth or remove their knowledge but rather that you have that same blessing to use it in a way that they're using it or even better. To use it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this is permissible. So this differs with this. This mas'ala, this issue has to do with what this hadith encourages us, which is not to want and beg and ask the people all the time and to covet what they have. So it's very important to
to put everything in perspective and not want to uh, just possess things and not want to possess and covet what other people have, especially just for the sake of possession and coveting. He has a car. I wish I had a car like that. He has this. I wish I had. He has a, a very nice, beautiful wife. I wish I had two beautiful wives just to have it. Just, just because, just, just to, just because he has one, okay. So this is a, a type of material uh, uh, um, quest and a material striving and race competing with people, but rather, and also to, it could even go into a hasid where you want to remove those nama. Oh, I wish that his car, uh, is, uh, you know is destroyed or is a wreck or gets a scratch on it or something just for the sake of hasid because you have envy and jealousy this is completely myth -moom, completely sinful and wickedness and that's the the overall uh most severe result of not practicing zuhud when a person is consumed by material and they want that material wealth to be taken away those ni'mah this ni'am to be taken away from someone else wa'iyadu billah and the last benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that people should spend their time and their energy striving for those things which will help them obtain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next hadith, hadith 1272, narrated Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I heard Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Allah loves a servant who is taqi, pious, ghani, free of needs, khafi, uh, unnoticed, ruahu or akhrajuhu muslim. This is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. The hadith of Sa'ad ibn Abi, uh, ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'anhu, in which he said, I heard the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Allah loves the servant who is a taqi. So this hadith uh, shows us the importance of being, uh, having taqwa, adhering to the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoiding his prohibitions. And again, that's from what? That's from wara, that's from zuhud. That's exactly what, that's a, that's a part of zuhud and a part of wara. And That is probably the reason Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani that he put this hadith in this, this bab that we see all of these, these group of ahadith which are referring to the importance of having that wara, having that, that God-fearfulness and especially with regards to material wealth and material items and what other people possess. And this hadith is also illustrating for us the importance of not always having uh, being out in front of the people. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those servants that fear him and they fear him in private and they are self-sufficient. They don't need the people and they don't need to require the praise of the people and the acknowledgement of the people or rather they go forward with righteousness in this hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam some of the benefits uh, that we, we see or in fact before getting into the benefits let's look at something in relation to this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the hadith 
began with the statement of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam when he said, Inna Allah yuhibbul abd. Very Allah loves the servant. And then he gave a description of the servant that is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be from amongst them. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Inna Allah yuhibbul abd. So this affirms for us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Again, this is another hadith which shows us and affirms for us the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That that is one of his characteristics. His divine characteristics. Tabarak wa ta'ala. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who possess certain traits. And if you gain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no other love that's really required to be protected and preserved, to be protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and loved by Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. There's nothing uh, as great as that. Nothing the creation can, can, uh, can, can grant you. No success because whatever happens in the creation really cannot harm you if you truly have the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You You have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of you and preserving you. Guiding you and preserving you. Ifad Allah yahfadak. Preserve Allah, uh, preserve the commandments of Allah and He will preserve you. And so how, now we, we get a, 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 a picture of how all of these ahadith, how they tie in together. How they illustrate the sifat of the mu'mineen, the characteristics of the believer. And this is why it's imperative. And this is such an important bab, such an important chapter for Ahl Sunnah to study because these are the characteristics of Ahl Sunnah. This is the characteristics we need to possess. Because it's the characteristics of the Mu'mini, Sifat the Mu'mini. It's the characteristic of those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And in this hadith specifically, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions four traits in this hadith to gain his love, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Four traits of those people who possess his love. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, in Allah yuhibbul abd. So then it asks, begs the question, who is the abd that Allah loves? Because we want to be from them. The first one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions from those sifat at taqi. So, the first one is the one who possesses taqwa. And we mentioned prior to this on countless occasions that taqwa Allah is ilzam or ilzam li awamirillah. It is adhering to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِجْتِنَابْ النواهي And it is avoiding and being away from the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those things He has prohibited. So that first characteristic we want to try and strive, the first attribute we want to get is to be of Ahla Taqwa. To be of those who put between themselves and the hellfire a shield. And that shield is righteousness, good deeds, and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and adhering to his commandments. And obeying him subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoiding his prohibitions. The so in fact we could say these four attributes or these four attributes of of the the mu'min or of the one who Allah subhanahu wa taala loves first is that they're an abd 
meaning an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they are a servant of Allah, meaning they're Muslim. Then the second one is that they possess taqwa, al abd al taqi. The third trait is that al ghani. And here, al ghani, that means al ghani an ghayrillah, wa ghani bi nafsihi. Meaning someone who relies only on Allah and they are self-sufficient when it comes to the creation. And this goes back to the last hadith we studied, that they're not someone who is begging the creation and asking from the creation, but rather they themselves are sufficient. And when they ask, they ask from Allah. They don't ask and beg the people. So that shows self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency that's limited because this is self-sufficient with regards to creation, but not the creator. And so that is a trait that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And the fourth trait is al-khafi. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned al-khafi. <clears throat> and this is the person who doesn't like to be in the forefront. They don't have to be uh, popular and heard of by the people. But rather, this goes back to their self-sufficiency. They don't need the praise of the people. They just need and, and the love and covet the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is immensely important for us to understand that and to practice that. Because it's easy for us to get distracted and strive to adhere and strive to gain the love of the people. From this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this hadith <coughs> affirms for us the love of Allah azza wa jal, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And this is Evidence from the statement of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Inna Allaha Yuhib Verily Allah loves So Ahlul Sunnah says Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala loves He possesses the characteristic of love And it is his divine unique characteristic uh, And there is nothing that resembles him And he is all hearing and all seeing Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is this hadith uh, is that this hadith encourages us to obtain those traits. To obtain those traits of righteousness. The trait of ubudiyati lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning being a righteous servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worshipping Allah alone. Ahl Tawheed, Ahl Iman. And the second trait is that they is to possess taqwa. And the third trait is to be self-sufficient. And the fourth trait is to not sh strive to be popular, to be famous, to be heard. Another benefit of this hadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith also shows us that we should do our best to be self-sufficient from what people possess. Meaning that we're not always asking and begging people. So we should do our best to be independent of that and be independent in general. So this also brings up another issue that... This is, this is also with regards to issues of the, of material issues such as wealth and possessions. And likewise, this also relates to, you know, asking for favors and assistance from people or asking them necessarily to make dua for us or other things, 
except out of necessity. That doesn't mean that they're, these are haram or these are even necessarily disliked. We're not putting a hukum and, and trying to, to say that. But in general, it's better and the one who is obtaining the love of Allah is the one who doesn't do those things unless it's an absolute necessity to ask for assistance, to ask for wealth, to ask for that extra support. But we're human beings and we do need that support from time to time. So that doesn't negate the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But being one who's always, who's excessive in these traits, in begging and, and asking from people, that that's negative. <clears throat> Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that also a person should strive to not be you know, not to, to obtain necessarily fame and to be above people and to, to, to strive to be known. That those aren't traits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. That doesn't negate that you want to spread khair to people and so on and so forth, but it can negate the fact of and illustrate the negative of hizbiya, meaning a person calling to their group or their sect or their person that they want to be popular. So they want everyone to take knowledge from them. So this is in, a, in the Islamic context of how uh, a person who is not observing this trait of being khafi, how they can, a trap that they can fall into, that they could want to be popular, they could want everyone to come back to them for knowledge, they could want the praise of the people. And these are negative traits, but rather they, if they're doing da'wah, they should do it the da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Calling the people to be a, a means and a wasila to khair. So it's a very fine line and it's something that the person calling to Allah and the person involved in teaching and those kind of things and the various forms of da'wah and charity that they need to be conscious of so so that they don't end up calling to themselves and, and wanting to just be popular amongst the people. And a great Imam who died in this time, in our contemporary times, Allah Yarhamahu, wa yaskarahu fi jannat fardos, and forgive him of his shortcomings and sins, Amin ya Rabbil Alameen, and this was a great Imam, a muhaddith of Yemen. His name was Imam Mukbil bin Hadi al Wadi Allah Yarhamahu. And a very famous statement that he mentioned with regards to Dawah and with regards to call what, what the person should be focused on calling to, not calling to themselves, not calling to their group, not calling to their sect and their party. But he said, Dawah to Ahl Sunnah, Dawatun ila. من كتاب الله إلى كتاب الله ومن سنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى سنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said that the da'wah of Ahl Sunnah, the call of Ahl Sunnah, the proper the method methodology of propagating the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم to Ahl Sunnah, to those people who are praiseworthy, because they follow the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Their da'wah is the da'wah. From the book of Allah to the book of Allah. And from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That's their da'wah, that's their call. Not to personalities and not to themselves. In the next hadith, Narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Part of a man's good observance of Islam is that he leaves the matters that do not concern him. Reported by a Tirmidhi who said it is Hassan. Said this is a Hassan Sahib, uh, Hassan Hadith. In this Hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it shows us that 
the part of perfecting a person's Islam is leaving off those things which don't concern them. That's a part of perfecting your Islam. So what we learn from this hadith, and there are so many benefits, but we're going to keep, for the sake of time, we're going to keep concise in these last group of hadith. Uh, the first thing, the first benefit we gain from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that Islam has, uh, that, that from amongst the Muslims, obviously those who practice Islam, that there are those who perfect their Islam and their Iman, and there are those who have defects. And this is in accordance with the practice of the servant, how they practice. And whether they do the wajibat and leave the muharramat or not. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith encourages us to leave off those things which don't concern us. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam referred to that as husna Husn al-Islam. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, or I, I should say related to that fa'ida, to relate it to that benefit of leaving off those things that don't concern you is also not engaging in vain speech. Things that are not going to benefit you but only cause you sin by getting involved in controversy and fitna. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in another hadith, he said, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلِكُوا خَيْرًا وَلِيَسْمُطْ that whoever believes in Allah and the day of judgment, then he should say something which is good or keep silent. Another benefit of this hadith is those things which a person needs and that are beneficial, that it is obligatory obligatory on the servant to strive to gain that knowledge and gain those things. And this is in accordance with the statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in the other hadith that we, uh, that we, uh, we studied already prior to this, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, Ihras ala ma yanfa'uka, wasta'an billah. Be vigilant in those things which benefit you and seek support from Allah. In the next hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, narrated Al-Maqdam ibn Ma'diq Ma Ma Karab radiyallahu ta'na'an Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam said A human being has not filled any vessel which is more evil to be filled than his stomach. A tirmidhi reported and graded as Hassan as a good sound uh, hadith. In the hadith of Al-Maqdam radiyallahu ta'ala anhu Makdam radiallahu ta'ala'in we see the importance of being and again this fits in line with wara 
and zuhud, asceticism and piety, of not being obsessive with regards to food. Eating for the sake of eating and being obese, you know, except when we when people have an ailment, something that affects them. But that we should not be excessive and we should eat that which is sufficient. And so what we learn from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, some of the benefits, uh, first is that the Sharia, the Islamic Sharia, that it came with the medicine of the heart and the medicine of the body. It came with both. And we learn that from this hadith because this hadith is telling us, is giving us a, a very simple practice or, or letting us know that a lot of evil stems from our eating habits, from being excessive especially. But also if you're not putting in the halal in there. And also if you're even putting the halal in there, but how you eat. It may be lawful, but it's still is possible that it has some effects, some harms, especially if you're excessive, like sugar. And like many other things that we eat that can be cancerous and cause all kind of ailments and all kind of diseases within our body. Those things we know and those things which we don't know. So it shows us the importance of, of exhibiting the zuhud and exhibiting the wara and not being excessive, eating just what's sufficient. Another benefit of this hadith is that a person should strive to be away from those things which cause harm and that the Sharia encourages us to be away from that which is harmful. In the next hadith, which is an, an immensely important hadith, a hadith we often quote, وعن أنس رضي الله تعالى عن قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كل ابن آدم خطة وخير الخطائين أتوابون أخرجه ترمذي وابن ماجة وسنده قوي uh, narrated Anas رضي الله تعالى عن الله's messenger صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم said all of the sons of Adam are sinners but the best of those sinners are those who repent often a Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah reported it and it has a qawi, a strong chain of narrators. This hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the hadith of Anas, shows us that we all commit many sins. Kul ibn Adam, kul bani Adam, yukhti. Okay? Uh, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, kul ibn Adam, khatta. Bin Uthaymin highlights the difference in those two statements. The statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and the statement uh, which could have been said, which denotes a different meaning. And he mentions that the statement that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, said, Kul ibn Adam khatta, that all the children of Adam are sinners, refers to that all the children of Adam, you know, all of us, that we make many sins, not just we commit some sins. We make a mistake here and there, but all of us make many sins. Some of us make many major sins and minor sins. Some of us make many minor sins, but all of us, we uh, share in sinning. We all make sins. And from that, we learn that the best of those, meaning the best of us, because we all do it, is those who repent to Allah subhanahu Ta'ala, not those who continue on to do sins and they don't, don't have any concern. They're not concerned about it. They don't feel anything in their heart. Their hearts are like dead. The Prophet والسلام, said in another hadith, Lo lem yadnabu ladhahab Allahu bikum wali jaa bi qawmin yadnubuna wa yastaghfiruna Allah wa yaghfir lahum. The Prophet والسلام, said in another hadith in Sahih Muslim <coughs> and he mentioned it this hadith was mentioned in two chapters in Sahih Muslim the chapter uh, of Tawbah and the chapter of Zuhd 
and the Rukhaiq, you know, the heart softeners and asceticism. So we see the relevance of this hadith that the imams of the sunnah, that they classified this hadith and they put this hadith in the chapter of zuhd and asceticism. Why? Because this is acknowledging the fact that we commit sins, that we do violate those principles of wara and violate those principles of zuhd. But part of that zuhd and part of that wara is coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Doing that which benefits you, which is ibadah. And that which benefits you is toba, and toba is a type of ibadah. Coming back to Allah and leaving off the sin. And along with that, as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, as far as ibadah, he said, al-ibadah is sabjabah li kullu ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardahu min af'al wa aqwal al-dahir wa batin. He said that ibadah is a comprehensive term for everything that Allah loves and is pleased with from deeds and actions, uh, from statements and actions that are open and hidden. And so that's wara and that's zuhd as well. That includes those, those concepts. And with regards to ibadah and regards to toba, it's very important that you have sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have ikhlas. Lillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another part of that toba, of that repentance, is that you feel sorrow for what you did. You feel sorrow and you feel sorry for what you did. You don't just do a sin and you just shrug your shoulders and keep pushing. But rather you feel sorrow for what you did. And the third thing is that you remove, you stop, you cease to do that sin, cease doing that sin, that action. You stop. That's sincere toba. That's real toba. And remove yourself from those environments. And the fourth concept or condition for that toba, if you will, is that you're determined not to return back to it. You're determined not to return back to it. Likewise, this includes making sure that you make toba before it's too late, before death is about to just take you. So it's very important to be vigilant and hirs ala toba. And this hadith encourages us to strive to make toba as soon as possible, or immediately, I should say. The last hadith in this. This chapter narrated uh, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Silence is wisdom, and few are those who practice it. Al Bayhaqi reported it in a shu'bah, I think. Yeah, I believe it's a shu'bah fi iman with a da'if uh, chain of narrators, and the correct view is that it is mokuf, a saying of Luqman. Al-Hakim. Al-Hakim. This narration of Luqman and others, uh, Ben Uthameen mentions that even that's a mistake, that in fact... That this, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but this uh, narration has been declared sound as far as being a statement of uh, uh, a sahaba, a sahabi. Radiallahu tana'inhum ajma'in. And this uh, narration shows us the importance of being silent and not involving ourselves in fitna. And that, as is stated 
elsewhere from other sources, meaning non-Islamic sources, silence is golden. That by keeping silent, a person avoids kethret, uh, many mistakes involving in controversy which has no benefit and excessive sins. And that it's from hikmah, it's from wisdom to be silent. And there's so many ahadith, as we mentioned one, that if you don't have anything good to say, then keep silent. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said. So this hadith for, uh, affirms for us that meaning. And it's in this chapter because this is also from uh, asceticism, from zuhud, and from wara, from piety. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and bless us to be from Ahl Iman and Ahl Wara and Ahl Zuhud. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.